It was only last year that you and I were taking a look at the all-new Nissan Rogue together, Nissan's most popular crossover in the United States. But a lot has happened since then. We have all-new models from the competition, including some of the best-selling entries in America, like the CRV, which should be on sale around the time that you're watching this video, the new Tucson, and of course the new Sportage as well. And the Rogue itself has changed since then. We have an all-new engine under the hood that has more of a focus on performance and efficiency than the Rogue has had in quite some time. So how does the Rogue fit in with the rest of the compact crossover competition? And should you put this handsome example on your shopping list if you're looking for a compact crossover? That's what we're going to talk about in this video. When it comes to the design inside and outside, I think Nissan hit the nail right on the head with this generation. It's certainly boxier than before and more aggressive with a lot of styling elements borrowed from larger Nissan vehicles. We have full LED headlights in every trim, including the base model, and LED accent strips right up top. These also double as the turn signals. One weird twist, this top end Platinum does not have fog lights down at the bottom. The Rogue has been on the large side of the compact crossover segment for some time, but that changes for 2023 because the competition has continued to grow and grow while the Rogue has remained about the same size. This is 183 inches long, putting it right between the CRV and the RAV4 for 2023. The new CRV grew considerably, giving it a bit more legroom than we find in the Rogue and a pretty big cargo area behind as well. If you're looking for a three row, you're not going to find that in the Rogue anymore. That was the previous generation. In other world markets, there is going to be a variant of this with a third row, but not in North America. If you want one, however, you could get a Mitsubishi Outlander, which is closely related to this. It's about two and a half inches longer, and it does have a teeny tiny third row in the back. This will be important later, but on all four corners, we have standard 235 with tires. These are a little bit wider than the ones that we find on the RAV4, pretty similar to what we find on the CRV. The lights up front might be all LED all the time, but even in this top end platinum trim, the rear lights are combination elements. So we have LED brake lights back here, but incandescent turn signals and incandescent backup lights. I think that's a bit of a missed opportunity. I would have loved to have seen some sleek LED turn signals back here. On the other hand, we have a very practical form and a much less controversial design than we find in some of the competition. I love the fact that Nissan is still giving us a very vertical hatch. That means that if you're putting bulkier items in the back of your crossover, it's going to be a lot easier to do in here than something with a really raked profile. At the bottom of the bumper, we have some chrome accents, and then they tuck the exhaust tips under the bumper in all trims. Two common complaints for the last few generations of Rogue have been that it was a little bit underpowered and that no hybrid system was offered. Nissan did have a bit of a flirtation with the hybrid Rogue, but it didn't last very long, and we don't see one in this generation, at least not yet. But they have addressed the other complaint, the lack of power. Under this hood, we find an all-new 1.5-liter turbocharged engine. But this is not a 1.5-liter four-cylinder like we find in the new CRV. This is a 1.5-liter three-cylinder engine, and I propose that this is actually a better engine than the one that we find in the CRV. You see, a three-cylinder engine makes a lot of sense when you stick a turbocharger on it. It actually has some exhaust scavenging benefits versus a four-cylinder engine, and that's obvious when you take a look at the power figures. 201 horsepower, 225 pound-feet of torque. That's a 20 horsepower bump over the outgoing four-cylinder engine, 44 pound-feet more than that engine as well, and all of that still gives you three miles per gallon better fuel economy. Unfortunately, it is still mated to a continuously variable automatic transmission, and while this is a fantastic engine, the transmission it's a little bit less fantastic, let's be perfectly honest. The cool thing about this engine is not just that it's a three-cylinder turbo, it's a variable compression turbo based on the same technology that we find in the Nissan Altima and some Infiniti models as well. It has the ability, it's the first and only engine in this segment to do this, to vary its compression ratio from eight to one up to 14 to one. You want the lower compression ratio for power when the turbocharge is really blowing, and you want the higher compression ratio for greater fuel efficiency when the turbo's not doing a lot. Unlike competitive engines that can effectively vary their ratio by leaving an intake valve open longer, this actually changes the stroke of the piston inside the cylinder. It's a really cool technology, and so far it has proved pretty reliable. This will give you up to 33 miles per gallon if you choose the front wheel drive model, 31 miles per gallon as equipped right here with all-wheel drive. That is definitely better than the vast majority of the competition, although not as efficient as real-world fuel efficiency numbers in something like the RAV4, but oddly enough, not too far off of real-world efficiency numbers in the new CRV Hybrid. 
If we lean in for a listen, you'll notice one of the interesting things about this engine. It's actually a little bit smoother than the four-cylinder engines that we find in the competition, and I think smoother than the outgoing four-cylinder engine that the Rogue had. It also sounds very different than a four-cylinder. To a lot of folks, this engine sounds a bit more like a V6 than a four-cylinder engine. And that makes a lot of sense because harmonics have a lot to do with the way that we perceive an engine sound. Remember that this engine is idling at around 800 RPM. So those cylinders are firing quite frequently. And the result is that we're not hearing one cylinder at a time. We're hearing how all those cylinders and their exhaust and intake pulses interact with one another in the intake manifold and in the exhaust manifold. And effectively, this is half of a V6. And for some reason, three-cylinder sounds seem to work in this way. So a three-cylinder engine and a V6 and an inline six don't sound too far off. Also, a V12 tends to sound a bit more like a V6 or an inline six than a V8 or a four-cylinder engine for some reason. Any way you slice it, it does have an intriguing exhaust note that is substantially similar to some of BMW's small engines that they have occasionally used in the US. You'll find those in many products and you do see in Europe. Front seat comfort continues to be a big win for the Rogue. I think these are among the most comfortable seats available in this segment, although they're not the most adjustable. We do have only a two-way adjustable lumbar support for the driver's seat, no adjustable lumbar support for the passenger seat, even in this top end trim. But we do get a two position memory over there and a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty large range of motion. I find this seat design more intrinsically comfortable, especially for longer distance journeys than the RAV4 or CRV seats. But you will want to spend a decent amount of time in all of the vehicles in this segment to find out which seat is exactly right for you because the length of the seat bottom cushion does vary from option to option. This is a little on the long side. So if you're a shorter person, you might not find this seat quite as comfortable. We do, however, have very generous headroom, especially if you opt not to get the panoramic moonroof. Jumping into the back, one of the first things you're gonna notice is that the rear doors open really, really wide, nearly 90 degrees to the side of the vehicle. If you're frequently getting kids in and out of child seats, that's gonna make this a lot handier if you have the room. Also, if you have people getting in the back that have mobility issues, this is gonna make that a lot easier. The other thing you'll notice is that the top end trim has integrated window shades, which is a nice touch, and one that we don't find in a lot of the competition. Moving to the middle of this second row seat, I have plenty of room here. We do have a hump in the middle, but it's fairly shallow. This model has three zone automatic climate control with heated rear seats, USB charge only ports there. And even if I scoot all the way over to the right side, I have plenty of leg room over here with this front seat moved all the way back in its tracks. However, you should know that with 80 inches of combined leg room in here, the Rogue is no longer class leading. It's more or less middle of the pack when it comes to the leg room figure. You will find some options out there with two to three inches more legroom than this. The rear seats have a recline mechanism. It moves about an inch and a half forward and backward. Also an inch and a half measurement to keep in mind, if you get the optional moonroof, you lose about an inch and a half of headroom in the back. However, for me at six feet tall, there is plenty of room back here. Sitting back here with my head against the headrest, I have about two and a half to three inches of headroom. So plenty of room back here for adult passengers, for child seats, and even a rear facing child seat positioned behind a six foot tall driver. I appreciate the fact that Nissan gives us a center shoulder belt that's integrated into the seat itself rather than coming out of the ceiling. That's going to be a lot more comfortable for younger people or shorter people. Also, it's going to mean that if you put a child seat right here in the middle and use the shoulder belt to attach it to the vehicle, it's going to sit more or less in the center. If you use the latch anchors, there are five of them in here. So we actually have one for the center seat position. It is shared with that outboard seat position. That seat is going to be skewed slightly towards the driver's side. That could make it easier for the driver to get the child in and out of that seat, but it means that this seat over here is essentially going to be useless because all the instructions tell you that you could only use that outboard seat if it doesn't interfere with the latch anchors and shoulder belt together. And you can see where that one is positioned right there. However, because this middle seat is wide enough, you could use the lap and shoulder belt to buckle that child seat right here in the center and still use the two outboard positions. When designing this generation of the Rogue, it's clear that Nissan was prioritizing a big and practical cargo area. You'll find 36 and a half cubic feet of storage space back here. Now, if you look at the spec sheet, you'll notice that SL and Platinum get 36.5 and the S and SV trims get 31.6. The difference is the load floor back here. It moves in two ways in the SL and Platinum and it doesn't move in the same way as the S and SV. But the number is somewhat deceiving because the cargo area is essentially the same size in both 
both versions. And both versions were able to get the exact same number of 24 inch roller bags back here. I was able to snag an SV trim for a very short test from a local dealer and it proved that the cargo areas were essentially the same. With the second row folded, you find an enormous 74 cubic feet of storage space back here. That is bigger than the vast majority of the competition. This continues to have what Nissan is calling their divide and hide cargo system, but it operates a little bit differently than vehicles that have used that terminology on before. Basically, we have two different load floor sections. I can put them in a lower position, right like that, and then use some of the extra space. I can stash away cargo under there. I can also completely remove them from the vehicle if I don't want them to be in the way. And I can use this one in this position as a cargo divider to help keep things from sliding forward and backward, either in front of or behind that divider. Pulling them out of the vehicle and going all the way down the rabbit hole, we have a temporary spare tire under there, and that's where they put the subwoofer for the optional audio system as well. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is the top end platinum trim, so obviously there are going to be things we find in here that we don't find in the base model, like this large panoramic moonroof, the window shades integrated into the rear doors as well. All models are going to have height adjustable shoulder belts and height adjustable headrests in the front, however. I think that this interior is one of my favorite interiors in this segment, including the new 2023 CRV. The seats are fairly attractive, especially if you get the lighter colored interiors, where it definitely breaks up a lot of the black on black design themes that we see in the competition. This has a subtle two tone design right there with the black accents on the outboard seat positions. However, these seats are not ventilated, something that I wish we would see because Nissan has loved ventilated seats in a lot of models in the past. For some reason, we don't find it in a lot of their inexpensive vehicles, however. Moving over to the front doors, we find a majority of soft touch materials in the upper section of the door, very comfortable armrest there, big bottle holder down at the bottom, and panning across the dashboard, a very attractive design to this dashboard. It's clean, it's luxurious, and it has a nice feel to it as well, especially if you take a look at the top end trim with the big LCD instrument cluster over here on that side. The base model is going to be a little bit plainer. The base model is also going to have a smaller infotainment screen in the center. This particular dashboard design might be a little bit old school and maybe a little bit plain compared to the cheese grater that we find in the CRV, but I think this is going to age better. Also kind of cool is the imitation wood grain sort of thing that we find on the dashboard. I like the, uh, the touches that they've done in here. This looks like open pour wood trim, but when you feel it, it's actually smooth, so easy to clean. It also appears to hide scratches really, really well. This interior does not have as much black plastic or piano black as we find in the competition, but obviously there's still some sections like around this infotainment screen. This supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay wirelessly as well. Uh, but if I move over to the native interface here, you'll notice that the native interface is not one of the more recent feeling interfaces. It's the same one that we find in a number of other Nissan products, but it doesn't look particularly modern. We have some physical buttons down there at the bottom of the screen, dual zone automatic climate control down there. There's also a third zone for the rear passengers in this model. We have yet more textures going on down here. So this is a hard plastic, but it has a texture that mimics the plastics at the bottom of the dashboard. Large G wireless charging mat there, a joystick style shifter, and another alternative to the piano black that we find in other models. This has horizontal lines in it, kind of reminiscent of wood, but also does not appear to show scratches very well, which is a nice touch. This knob, however, it's black plastic. I suspect it would. That's the drive mode selector. Between the front seats, we have a large armrest. It opens to reveal a large storage area. You could fit a half gallon of milk in there. And then we have a curious little button. Rather than putting the ambient light controls in the infotainment system, Nissan gives us this hidden little button. It turns the system on and off and changes the colors both. On the driver's side, we find a large full LCD instrument cluster, something that is oddly missing in the new CRV. It just has a small partial LCD on the left side. We do find full LCDs in some of the Korean competition, but I think this display is a little bit more attractive. Uh, really, that's a personal preference, however. We get two different looks. We get the more traditional analog dial there, and then we can move them over to the side. But what I think is undeniable is that more of the screen real estate in the middle here is used for the various displays. So for instance, the variable compression layout, things like a uh, tableau view there where you can see things like your CarPlay readouts or a dedicated media view where you have CarPlay album art showing there. Definitely more of that screen is used than we find in the Tucson and the Sportage. Moving out from there, we find a flat bottom steering wheel, which is kind of a nice thing. We find paddles on the back of the steering wheel all 
Although I think they could have just skipped those because paddle shifters on a CVT just don't make a lot of sense to me. They're about as useful as paddle shifters on a poodle. Down here we have volume up, down, track forward, backward, controls for that multifunction LCD cluster, and then the controls for the adaptive cruise control over on this side. All right, it's now time to get all three cylinders out on the road and see what this baby's capable of. Zero to 60 happened in 8.1 seconds in my testing. But there is a bit of a twist. The fastest 0 to 60 time in this was about 2 tenths faster, 7.9 seconds, which is a very respectable time. But there's a weird thing. You don't get that by simply flooring it and waiting and going in a straight line. Because of the peculiar nature of Nissan's continuously variable automatic transmission, some people in the media call this a rubber band effect. Whatever you want to call it, there is something a little bit odd about most Nissans with a CVT. If you floor it, you're getting pretty decent acceleration. But if I back on the throttle off a little bit, then you'll actually get a little bit more acceleration. And weirdly, the fastest zero to 60 time was when this vehicle was not floored all the way down with the throttle all the way 100%. It was actually more like throttle position 95% or so. When this wasn't revving quite as high, it actually got the faster zero to 60 time. The reason 8.1 seconds is up there rather than 7.9, however, is that that is not the acceleration time you're commonly going to get if you want to go 0 to 60 quickly. You're going to end up right there at the 8.1 mark. That is definitely faster than most recent reports of the CRV. I haven't been able to test the new 2023 at home, but it seems like it's going to be right around 8.5 seconds or so. That is definitely not overly speedy. But some of the hybrid alternatives that you might want to cross shop against this are going to be quicker, most notably the CRV hybrid. That model is probably going to be around 7.5 to 7.2 seconds, somewhere in that range. So a little bit quicker than this. Thanks to the wide tires that this model has, the stopping distance was definitely respectable at 115 feet, as is the handling ability. And I'm going to continue to give this an A as far as handling ability. Now, when it comes to handling engagement, that's sort of a different question. As far as grip and confidence goes, this has a good feel to it, and you can definitely drive this Rogue harder than a decent number of the options in this segment. When it comes to absolute grip, this compares very well against some of the traditional excellent handling options like a Mazda CX-5, but the feel is totally different. This has kind of numb steering compared to the Mazda that feels very accurate, more engaging. But as far as the actual grip ability of this vehicle versus the CX-5, they are shockingly similar thanks to the wide tires and the suspension design we have on the Rogue. This is perfectly competent and it's very confidence inspiring. It's just not really going to set any lap records at your local racetrack. When it comes to ride quality, I'm going to give this model an A minus. Out on a rougher gravel road like I'm on here, you'll notice that the rear suspension can sometimes get just a little bit upset, but I think it is a little bit better sorted than we find in the Mazda CX-5. The most recent CRV, Tucson, and Sportage do punch a little bit above this, but the ride quality is pretty similar to the current generation RAV4. Back out on the road at 50 miles an hour, I measured 70 decibels in this cabin, certainly making this quieter than the RAV4. Also, I think quieter likely than the new CRV. I was a little bit disappointed in the sound deadening in the CRV. They just didn't do quite enough with that, in my opinion. Of course, I won't have an official score until I can get that back at home, so be sure and stay tuned for that CRV review if you're debating between this and the next generation CRV. This is pretty quiet for this segment, but you will find a limited number of options that have road noise a little bit more under control. I think that the current generation Sportage is actually doing a really good job when it comes to road noise, as is the Ford Escape. But neither of those vehicles, unless we're talking about the hybrid model, of course, is going to have anything on this when it comes to fuel economy. Over a week of mixed driving, I've been averaging 32 miles per gallon. That is very impressive for a non-hybrid. If you want better fuel economy than this, you really will have to look at options like a RAV4 hybrid or the CRV hybrid. But the CRV hybrid in real world driving is only going to be a few miles per gallon above this. As always, keep in mind that those fuel economy numbers are on my daily commute where I go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass every day. So it is doubly impressive, again, considering that this is not a hybrid. Now, there are those hybrids and there are more hybrids and plug-in hybrid options than there ever have been before. Honda says that about half of the CRVs on the dealer lot are going to be hybrids. We have strong hybrid presence from Kia, from Hyundai, and then of course the classic hybrid in this segment, the RAV4. It's been around for some time and it is the leader when it comes to fuel economy. You will definitely get 40 miles per gallon in the real world in very mixed driving in that RAV4. And if you'd rather have a RAV4 with a plug, theoretically one is available, although good luck finding one on dealer lots. Now about that engine a bit more. Let's go ahead and slow things down so I can rev it up. 
you can definitely hear that it has a V6-like sound out on the road. Everybody that drove in this vehicle with me this week thought that it had a V6, actually. They didn't quite realize that it was a turbocharged engine. They thought that it was just a relatively smooth V6. However, everybody knew that it had a continuously variable automatic transmission, even though this one imitates transmission shifts. And that's likely because when Nissan transmissions like this do those imitation shifts, they end up feeling awfully fake. They're kind of slow, they're a little bit on the mushy side, and the downside, of course, is that it actually makes the vehicle slower 0 to 60. If this just held the engine at 5,500 RPM or so and just hung out there as you accelerated, this would be notably faster 0 to 60. But according to Nissan's research, customers dislike that. They want the transmission to do some sort of shifty thing, and that's why this is programmed to do that. The last thing we should talk about is the interplay between the variable compression engine and the continuously variable automatic transmission. In other Nissan and Infinities with the variable compression engine, that would be the two liter four cylinder engine and the CVT, there are some peculiar things going on as there's a lot being varied there. I think this is definitely better sorted. Some of that seems to be the fact that this three cylinder engine actually has a better torque curve than we find in that two liter four cylinder engine. But also, I think that Nissan has just worked on the software programming between the transmission and the engine. That said, if you are the kind of person that wants to drive your crossover more aggressively, you might see some disconnect between the engine programming and the transmission programming. Although, I would posit that if you are a more aggressive driver, you've probably bought something else, because this is more focused on the classic, more pragmatic virtues in this segment. The big cargo area in the back, the big and practical back seat, the soft and comfortable ride, the comfortable driver's seat, high fuel economy, and a nicely isolated cabin. I don't mind the fact that this is not the sportiest entry in the segment because it does all of those other things much better than the average in this segment. Summing up the 2023 Nissan Rogue is pretty easy. It's attractive, solidly practical, efficient, comfortable, and very child seat friendly. If you have young children, this is definitely a model that I would recommend over a decent number of the competition because of the ease of getting kids in and out of the back, the extra latch anchor that we have back there, the center mounted seat belt, etc. All of that really pays dividends if you're dealing with child seats on a regular basis. Now on the downside, we have the CVT software. It is definitely not my flavor. I really wish that Nissan would take a page out of Honda's book, mimic what's going on with their CVT, or at least give shoppers the choice. Do you want your CVT to hang out there at 5,000 RPM as you accelerate? That will get you probably half a second faster, zero to 60, or do you want it to do this imitation shift thing? I wish it was an option in there. Also, there's still no hybrid system. That's something that is seriously lacking in this segment because just about everybody else out there has a hybrid option, including the closely related Mitsubishi Outlander. Now, the Outlander is a plug-in hybrid. It's not gonna be as efficient as a RAV4 when it's not operating on electricity from your house, but it is a hybrid system nonetheless, and you can buy one right now in the US can't get a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid Rogue. Also, the infotainment software is a little bit less snazzy than I would like. On the other hand, we have a lot of premium features that you don't find on a number of the competitors, including a full heads-up display, 360-degree camera, and the full LCD instrument cluster, also the rear window shades that we find on this top-end platinum trim, and you won't find most of those features at any price on a Honda CRV for some reason. Value pricing and discounts on the dealer lot have long been a Nissan sales proposition. For this generation Rogue, however, pretty much all you're getting is the value pricing. Not too many discounts are happening on any dealer lot, regardless of brand in the US. The base Rogue is gonna start at 27,360. If you want all wheel drive, the minimum price point is gonna be 28,860 plus the destination charge. The top end platinum trim, which is what I've been driving today with all wheel drive, 38,640. That's very competitive against most of the competition, especially the close competition from Toyota and from Honda. I recently drove the new 2023 CRV and it's gonna to top out right at about the same price as this, but not have all the same features. It won't have the 360 camera, the LCD instrument cluster, that full LCD, few other features that we find on this one that we don't see on that CRV. Now, the CRV hybrid is gonna give you better zero to 60 acceleration. The 1.5 liter turbo on it is actually gonna be slower zero to 60 than this model. Economy, that is a bit of a toss up to be honest because real world fuel economy in Honda's hybrid system has not really lived up to expectations. So expect it to be a few miles per gallon better than this on the highway in mixed city driving, maybe six miles per gallon better, but depending on the way you drive and the kinds of drives you do, you may actually get very similar fuel economy to this. 
Aside from that, pricing is really quite in line with the bulk of the competition. At the moment, Kias and Hyundais are selling well over MSRP, and the average Nissan is selling a lot closer to MSRP, so the real-world difference is probably going to be a little bit different than you see on your screen right now. Let me know, what would you pick if you were shopping in the meat of this segment, I would say? The approximate thirty dollars to $34,000 price range. Would you get a mid-level trim of the Nissan Rogue, which I think is more attractive than the Kia Sportage? I know that is somewhat controversial at this moment. I also think that the entire package is more attractive than the Hyundai Tucson. It's not going to be as exciting to drive as either of those options with the CVT under the hood and just the way that Nissan has tuned the Rogue, but I think it's still a very solid option. What would you pick and why? Let me know down there in the comment section below. And of course, find me over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social places. And of course, stay tuned for upcoming reviews, a full review of that new 2023 CRV included just as soon as I can get my hands on one. Hit the subscribe button, hit the notify button, and I will see all of you next week.